Welcome to the Firehouse Chat. Today we're talking to Corey Brunton, Lead Design Architect, President and CEO of Brunton Architects and Architects and Engineers. Corey, you started working out for an architect firm, another architect firm. What prompted you to start your own business in 2007? Uh, well, 2007 wasn't exactly the easiest time, especially the tail end of it to start a business, uh, but we didn't know that at the time. Uh, we started our business in October uh, of 2007. Uh, shortly thereafter came the, the, the economic crisis. But we started our business because um, I want, you know, bigger is not better. Uh, I wanted to design a, a boot or create a boutique design firm that focused uh, more on client uh, relations, uh, focused heavily on design, was more of a architecturally led uh, firm that had engineering rather than an engineering led firm. Um, and so pushing heavily on value, creativity, um, that was really, really important. And so we, we did that um, and you know, God blessed us huge. Uh, con the firm has continued to grow. Um, and so we've had some great opportunities and some great clients. Your firm re recently won a station design award for the Monticello, 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 Minnesota Fire Station. Um, you also are a firefighter. And so did you plan to design fire stations when you joined the fire department? You know, I think I designed my first fire station back probably in 1993, 94. I've been doing this quite a while. Um, I joined the North Mankato Fire Department in 2009 and um, have been with them since. No, I, did, I didn't know that it would be a specialty for me, uh, to be honest with you. But firefighters are probably the most down-to-earth people you'll ever meet. Um, meat and potato eaters, right? Uh, we hunt fish, right? Uh, we're very uh, uh, resourceful. Uh, we have just found an absolute niche uh, at being able to service those clients um, me being a firefighter and always having the desire to want to be one, um, I look at fire station design both from the firefighter perspective, from the construction perspective, and from the operations perspective. Um, and so I think we bring something pretty unique to the table when it comes to evaluating what um, those folks need for facilities. Um, but we never pretend to know everything. We, we got to always tell my staff we have to have bigger ears than mouths. <laughs> uh, we want to make sure that we're listening more than we're talking. But in the end, we bring our experience and expertise uh, to the table and talk to them about the problems and challenges that they have and find uh, unique uh, responses to those and hopefully engage them in a way that they've never been engaged and gain their trust. Well, if you started with your first station that long ago, I bet you've seen a lot of changes in fire stations since that time. Boy, have we ever, uh, especially since this, um, you know, the cancer awareness uh, has really, really been a hot topic at just about every convention you go to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, you know, cancer has been around forever, probably, you know, we don't know why a lot of people passed away earlier uh, in life, but uh, as we become more and more aware of cancer, we find ways to uh, mitigate uh, the effects of it on firefighters. Um, as you mentioned, being a fellow, fire, being a fellow firefighter, uh, we wear Nomax uh, hoods. And when we're uh, fighting a fire, our necks are just uh, usually soaking wet, not to be gross, but, uh, uh, and when your pores are open, you're bringing in all kinds of um, impurities and uh, potentially carcinogens. And so uh, just those known facts uh, help us evaluate um, how to make coming home to the station even safer. Mm -hmm. And so we create hot zones, warm zones, and cold zones where we're, we're paying particular attention to, um, to the potential for um, contamination. And so areas where firefighters can, can jump into a, a, a steam sauna, uh, and what they call sweat it out or hour, shower within the hour. Um, those things are impacting fire station designs and have uh, changed it dramatically. Uh, point of capture exhaust handling systems, for example, um, are pretty much the standard now. And 
um, being able to capture all those exhaust systems right at the point, right at the, at the fire truck itself, allowing us to do truck checks uh, and, and run those vehicles in the, in the cold winter days and not have to have the doors open like we had to in the past. Placing firefighter gear in positively pressurized spaces rather than um, out in the apparatus bay spaces. Uh, and so just trying to mitigate that, providing toilet rooms that when you're in your turnout gear and when you're training, you're not walking into the public areas of the building and contaminating those public restrooms that people like yourself might walk into and use. And so those elements do help create uh, space programming and planning in, in the earliest stages of design. And yes, it, it has drastically af affected the design of fire stations moving forward. That's interesting. You mentioned the, the dirty washrooms, bathrooms, um, mm -hmm. because that did come up in one of the stations that was submitted for the station design award. They talked about having a separate dirty washroom so that when they come in, obviously they can go right away. I'd, I'd never heard that applied to that terminology before, but that, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Can I ask you a question about the exhaust systems? Um, the other thing I noticed um, out of the 66 fire stations we had entered in the award, 13 of them had two exhaust systems. They had the, the direct capture and then they had another one and do you think that's going to be a trend, you know, kind of the belts and braces type thing? I do. Um, we, we do that as well. Um, not for a lack of a, of a, of a better term, but we call the, the systems that are, that are kind of encompassing the entire uh, apparatus bay. We call that kind of the poor man system. It's the code required minimum. Um, you know, we have a system in there because quite frankly, it's not just the trucks that emit, um, carbon monoxide in the space. You, we have to start, start up K-12 saws, uh, chainsaws. We have to start up all kinds of equipment, generators, uh, and we have to test that equipment. That equipment needs to run for a while to make sure that, that, they, that they operate, that they can start when they're needed. And uh, those elements need to be taken into consideration too. And so this, both systems, um, the point of capture systems start up immediately. Um, but the other uh, entire building system will start up when the uh, levels are hit for parts per million and those, those systems will be triggered. And so they trigger, they trigger a, a, an inline fan system uh, and an exhaust system. And so when one turns on, it interlocks and turns the other on. The highest point in the fire station oft, oftentimes is the hose tower. And so we, we look for opportunities to use that hose tower for more than just that one function. And so uh, oftentimes we'll place the exhaust systems up in those, in those higher spaces where the, the exhaust will, will tend to accumulate. You know, with the increasing budget restrictions, more and more departments are starting to have training and classrooms in their stations. How would you approach or how do you approach training and educational features when you design a facility? That's a, that's a good question. Um, we've, we look at every single project uh, uniquely uh, for each community and for each standard or for each uh, fire station standard operating procedures. But, but overall, every station needs to have the opportunity to provide a support system for training. Training is the most important thing that we can do to keep ourselves safe. Um, think about this, 25 years ago, did we have electric cars? Mm -hmm. we, if, we, if we did, we didn't have very many. And, and I can tell you that there's not many firefighters that knew where they could cut that car if they had to get somebody out with the jaws of life. And nowadays, cutting that car at the wrong location can, can be an electrifying experience and can kill you. Training has never been more important now uh, in, in our entire history as we continue to evolve as a, as a, as a community um, and the technology advancements that are constantly occurring. And we have to stay on top of that. Um, another classic example, back when I was in, in high school and grade school, and a long time ago, um, even the basic life safety training that we had really focused on different intervals for, um, you know, compressions and breaths. Well, now that has all changed, even within the last several years. So basic life safety training, uh, BLS, has totally changed. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. We wouldn't, we need to train on that because it's muscle memory that keeps us responding efficiently on the event of a crisis. Uh, you don't need to be, well, what was that again? Um, how many breaths and how many counts? And, you know, you need to train on that. So because that's changed, uh, training has never been more important. And so we need to make sure that we provide spaces that allow for firefighters to, to congregate in a classroom setting as well as push the tables aside, put them in the storage areas and get down on your hands and knees and do, and do uh, training as well, whether it's basic life safety training or whether it's ropes and knots, it doesn't really matter. But to continue to an- answer your question, we look for opportunities inside the building. This, you know, a lot of our stations are designed in the upper Midwest, not all of them, mm-hmm. but you know, it gets cold up here. Uh, this is Minnesota. And uh, there's a lot of days in the wintertime that uh, you don't want to be training outside or repelling down a building in the outside. So we find opportunities to push those opportunities indoors. For example, on a storage mezzanine, we enclosed a small section of a storage mezzanine and we uh, created a situation where firefighters could could put a ladder up against uh, an enclosed area, which actually happened to house an com- air compressor which makes a lot of noise. So we wanted it inside anyway. Mm -hmm. Then they can knock out a window and they can actually do a rescue Randy um, exercise. They can take people uh, and rescue them out of that space. That's all 100% indoors. Mm -hmm. But the function of it was to keep the compressor in an isolated area so it wasn't making noise in the rest of the apparatus bay. We look for those opportunities. You know, I remember back in 2007, 2008, um, a lot of departments couldn't afford to travel for training in that. And so I suspect with what's been going on with the COVID, I think we're going to start to see budgets crunching again. Um, I heard about one situation out on the East Coast that, again, with all the empty big box stores that are showing up now, um, that there's a possibility to set one up and re- remodel it for training. Have, have you thought about that at all? You know, uh, adaptive reuse is, is actually a pretty, um, pretty important opportunity. Um, of course, it reduces the amount of, of uh, landfill, right, by, by reusing a building rather than demolishing it. Actually, I think behind me is an example of that. Um, that was an old furniture warehouse store that was re- revamped into a retail uh, and restaurant uh, facility. Didn't look anything like that. But adaptive reuse is very important. The things to keep in mind when you're looking at an existing building is certainly you want to reach out to an architect to help you look at uh, the barriers that might be in place in it. There's a number of things that have to be considered, like the fire rating of the building, the size of the facility, the locations of firewalls. And the biggest thing that should not be forgotten is the distance between columns. Because if you're going to try to use the facility, especially if you're going to try to park apparatus in there, you want to make sure that you have at least a 20 foot wide bay in there. And some of those spaces have shorter column bays than that, which could be problematic. Um, the support of the floor and then, of course, a full structural and mechanical evaluation would be important. But yeah, absolutely. Why not? Um, you end up with the shell for the most part, the roof, maybe some of the mechanical units as well as the concrete floor system that could be reusable depending upon the use. Another thing that we're hearing about um, a lot is the mental um, aspect of firefighters. You know, their job is so stressful. And um, I think they're just now beginning to acknowledge that, you know, they need to get help sometimes to talk about some of this stuff. Talking around the kitchen table is great, but it reaches a point where there needs to be more. What are you seeing or what are you doing to address some of these issues with the PTSD and depression in public safety or in fire facilities? Well, I I think it varies depending upon the type of uh, facility that we're designing. If it's a career station, a full-time station, that'll have sleeping rooms and day rooms and opportunities for um, firefighters to engage uh, each other. If it's a paid on call station, they may have more, they may have just the exercise room spaces, maybe a small day room, but each each station uh, design has its own unique uh, program and, and uh, opportunities. I think we would custom design that to whatever the needs of the, of the, uh, uh, the station are. But to answer the question, um, you know, 
being a fire, fellow firefighter, it's another family. I mean, it's, uh, and uh, having those spaces designed so that they allow that interaction allows you to, um, to, to grow together. And when you train as much as we do um, or need to, um, that just kind of inherently happens. I think giving them bright uh, spaces to, to, to uh, work and, and, uh, and live in, if you will, uh, trying to create uh, warm spaces that are inviting and allows you to relax and decompress. Um, you know, a lot of firefighters I know, you know, are, are do other things, extracurricular things to, to help decompress. But in the end, I think compartmentalization is really the most important element. And that, that allows you to, you know, when, you, when you're dealing with something that you didn't think you'd see, um, you don't want to necessarily take that stress home. You figure out how to compartmentalize in that. And that's different for everybody. Um, some people know how to do it and some don't. And um, so if they, if they don't, then, of course, seeking help is, is really important. And as you mentioned, uh, municipalities are understanding that those things do occur. I know in our station and our fire department in, uh, in North Mankato, if we go through a situation where there's a death, uh, there's automatically uh, a debriefing uh, that would occur as well as some um, counseling that's offered up. And I'm sure most uh, communities have that available as well. So with all this stuff going on and all the things that, are, that you're doing, how do you keep up with all the fire service trends? Well, of course, with, uh, with training, uh, we go to a lot of seminars, um, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of uh, events across the nation. We were in Vegas here not that long ago. Um, there's just, and, you know, with this whole COVID thing, this has really kind of slowed down those uh, uh, gatherings, if you will. But, you know, staying current, reading magazines and, you know, like Firehouse, for example, staying in touch with, with you folks and, and looking at all the good articles out there, uh, reading what others have done, learning from what others have, have seen and experienced is, is super important. And let me say this, I always tell my staff, I say, here's the deal. The day you stop learning is the day you stop breathing. And if that's not the case for you, then you're in the wrong place. Um, it's super, super important to keep your eyes wide open and uh, continue to learn in this constantly changing uh, world we live in. You know, I'm, I'm seeing a lot more fire service architects or people that specialize in fire service and public safety facilities. What is it that sets your company apart from your competitors? Well, I think, I think part of it is that, you know, we're not trying to be, to be big. Um, we're trying to be better. You know, we want, you know, I've been a part of a, a company, actually been part of a, an ownership team that, you know, we had well over 150 employees. That doesn't make you, that doesn't make you better. Being, being bigger does not make you better. It's, it's important to, to recognize that when you're setting up a, a company and trying to create a culture that everybody can buy into. Um, being an architecturally led firm versus an engineering led firm for us allows us to be, um, because I'm the firefighter in the group, uh, allows us to focus on those aesthetic things and balance it with cost. Um, and, you know, I think we have, we have a unique perspective. I also worked construction for quite a while before becoming an architect. I've had a lot of people say that that ought to be a prerequisite. And I, I guess I don't totally agree. I'm also a farm kid. So that means I can pretty much put about anything together if I have to with a torch. Um, but, you know, just our perspective on, um, being a boutique firm and it's service first. Um, we put together some of the best plans out there. We have a reputation for um, having projects that have less than one third of 1% in change orders. And that's really hard to find. Um, but we really pride ourselves on putting together very, very tight plans. In the end, the client is relying on us and, they're, and again, they trust that we will do that for them. Um, so in the end, that's, that's kind of how I think we, we differ. I, I was looking at your website and I noticed that your tagline is designing with integrity, building on trust, the designing on integrity part I get, but you know, how, how do you really build trust with 
a client when you're if you're far away from them right now you can't you know you can travel but it's difficult yeah i totally agree um <clears throat> well for me i'm also a pilot um and so uh, i love to fly it's been something that has been a, a childhood dream just like being a firefighter uh, ever since i can remember um, so we we have a, an airplane that we fly all over the country uh, we were down in North Carolina, not that long ago. It's about a three hour flight. So, we, you know, we can get just about anywhere. We're doing a lot of work in the upper five states right now and, and branching out to surrounding states as well. Um, but there's probably not a location in the continental United States I can't get there in under three hours. Yeah. So that's that has allowed us to service our clients. We have a client in uh, Western North Dakota, uh, awful close to the Montana border, which based on experience and having had to do this when my airplane was in for service, I had to drive that. That was 14 hours of the most miserable driving uh, I, I can imagine. But uh, uh, being able to get to them and service them, when they say, hey, can you come for a meeting? Yeah. When do you want me? And being able to, you want me now? I can be there in about three hours, you know, and or two hours. And it, that's really allowed us to open up our market and service our clients. And having a, a passion for service wanting to help providing added value is what we do and our clients are our best advertising um, we rely on them to tell others how great the experience was and i want to over over deliver and under promise every chance i get and being able to do that has really really um, helped us a lot expand our market i know a lot of fire departments start their dreams of building a new station you know, start scratching out on little, you know, napkins or scraps of paper and that. But at what point should a fire department approach, you know, an architect about moving ahead or starting to build or, you know, where do they start and kind of what's the process then? Yeah, um, probably immediately. And I know that sounds like a canned answer, uh, but for example, finding an opportunity, finding opportunity inside options is what we do. We're problem solvers. Some people would look at an opportunity like what's behind me and say, you know, that building should have been leveled. Now it doesn't look like that. It didn't look like that initially. And quite frankly, we could have leveled it. Um, it would have been the easier solution, but we don't take the easy solution uh, uh, path. We take the path that's best, most economically viable for our client. Determining that takes experience and experience is what we bring to the table. So looking at projects both from an operation standpoint, from being a firefighter, from an architect, from a construction standpoint, we look at everything with those glasses on. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question to answer or to, to ask. The answer is almost immediately. And if you can do that, bring an architect in, um, to look and evaluate your situation, whether you don't, if you don't know what you want, we can help you determine that. Um, a lot of our clients will have us help them write their program of spaces that they need based upon our, our common practices. Mm -hmm. We will do that. They say, well, I don't know how, we know we need uh, five bays or 10 bays, but we don't know how big the building is. And we don't know how much it needs to cost. And my answer to them is that's what we do for you. Uh, and, and the answer to the cost side is, let's see if we can't make it cost as little as possible. Um, nobody needs to pay more than they have to, to get a facility that meets their needs. And that's our goal is to try to find that efficiency and balance that with them, with their budget. So immediately is your answer. <laughs> you know, I'm hearing you're involved in obviously your company or a lead designer, you're a CEO, you're a president, you're uh, on call. I mean, you're, you go when the bell rings firefighter. Um, so your life sounds like it could be pretty stressful. And, and what is it that you do to uh, relieve stress and take it easy? Yeah. Uh, well, you're right. There's, there, there's, there's a lot that I'm involved in and, and I do need to simplify life a little bit as I move and get a little bit older. Um, but I, you know, I have hobbies. Um, I, I have a, I have a koi pond. So I have 30 koi that, that uh, in about a 4,000 gallon pond that I, I got a, it was my daughter's graduation. And I, I said to my wife, this is about a month and a half before I said, I got this great idea. She says, what's your idea? I said, I need to rent a backhoe. 
So I rented a track backhoe and I brought it in my backyard and I dug it apart. It looked like a bomb went off back there. And she goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm building a koi pond. Can't you see it? And she said, no. But I got it built and uh, imported boulders from a good farm friend of mine. And it's one of the coolest spaces. So it's my, it's my little serene getaway. Um, I've, I've got 30 koi that are anywhere from, you know, this big to 14, 16 inches and they stay in there all winter long. And, uh, but they're my little pets. And so I do that. Of course I fly. Um, I'm a hunter. I fish. Um, I downhill ski. I snowmobile in the mountains. Um, I skydive, not as much as I used to, but, uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm kind of a thrill seeker. I like to race. Um, I wrote, wrote track, um, Corvette race up in, in Northern Minnesota. So I race on the track up there and yeah, I'm kind of a thrill seeker, but, uh, but I enjoy life too. And, and, uh, but yeah, but I need to relax more. I know that. <laughs> it sounds like it. Thanks so much for your time, Corey. I really appreciate it. And thank you for watching the Firehouse Quick Chat.